Hello, my name is Jason O'Leary. I'm a Quest Scholar here at Arizona State University, and I'm pursuing a PhD in the human and social dimensions of science and technology. So my research at Quest deals with solar PV as part of a larger scale sustainable energy system. So what does that mean? I'm going to start off talking about my main argument, and then we'll go into looking at uh, a few case studies, and then after that we'll talk about conclusions and suggestions. So current energy policy deals with the three pillars of sustainability, economic, environmental, and social, through science and technology uh, in a very tech-determinist way. In other words, science technology is meant to solve all of our problems in these different realms. So looking at a strong sustainability model, we actually have all these things existing in a nested format. So societies only exist within the environment, whether they be large or small and economies only exist within societies. My research deals mostly with the red social circle here, that sphere. Now, science technology, we see, affects not only the environmental, social, and economic, but is also affected by in the environment, social, and economic concerns. So my main argument is that solar energy policy is not simply about technology, innovation, distribution, and adoption of technology, but it's also about the distribution of wealth and power. So new socioeconomic arrangements are formed through policy within these large-scale socio-technological systems. And that's not always well represented in policy. So let's look at the policies that do exist and some of the data. Case number one, solar equity in Metro Phoenix. I took some empirical data looking at where the solar is and where it's not. In the wealthier neighborhoods, Paradise Valley and Scottsdale, lots of solar. In the uh, uh, low-income neighborhoods of Southwest Phoenix, there's very little to nil of solar. And here's a uh, scatter graph that shows a correlation between the amount of solar in a given neighborhood um, and we're using housing as a proxy for wealth. So there is a correlation there. So solar leasing is another option for people who can't afford the full cost of a solar system, even with the uh, incentives. So to get a zero down solar system on your roof, you still need a 700 credit rating for most solar installation companies. And that's kind of a high bar for a lot of people to meet. So those who can put down a little bit more money up front make some more money back, about $4,000 more. Those who can put down a much larger upfront payment get roughly $7,000 more than those who put zero down. But even then, again, it's still hard. You have to get into the market with a 700 or better rating, credit rating. So California created some uh, policies to so their California Solar Initiative, CSI, and I focused on their multifamily affordable solar housing initiative which was split up into track one and track two. Track one benefits mostly the landlords and track two benefits the tenants to a greater degree. Now, this is only basically to get the solar on the roofs of lower income housing. That's what this particular part of this policy is for. And they're very similar, track one and track two. The difference being that track two needed to show some quantifiable, be quantifiable benefits to the tenants whereas track one had a lower threshold to meet in order to get the incentives, even though they were not as great as incentives as track two. So track two eventually was swept into track one, those funds uh, roughly a few years into the policy, and um, the average tenant will be perhaps um, in San Diego, for instance, roughly about $8 uh, off of their bill instead of uh, the much greater benefits that would be received if they own the system. Um, and the landlord's getting a pretty good deal off out of this as well, and they're definitely being able to make their return on investment. So the conclusion, the economic, technological, and environmental factors are pretty well represented in policy already. There's a lot of metrics for those that already exist. Societal factors, however, are not always well considered, and not fully considered throughout the policy. So we see socioeconomic arrangements being modified and unintended consequences as a result. Some suggestions. Assess the distributional consequences up front. Do the best we can through systems thinking, not just about individual consumers, landlords, or tenants, or, uh, or households, but about neighborhoods and regions. And think about, use futures thinking and strategies to do this, looking uh, in multi-decadal uh, length of time, because that's what energy really needs. So we can use scenario planning and other strategies to do this. Thank you. That's my research, so thank you very much.